let me begin with the slide, the common slide that many of you have seen. Uh, India has uh, a high diversity of amphibians. They are mostly frogs, which are around 425 as of now. Uh, the newts, the cord belonging to order Chordata, which are two in number, and uh, the order Gymnophenal Sicilians, which are like around 40. Uh, Omkar told today that uh, there has been a tremendous increase in uh, species description uh, beginning in the year 2000 and, and forth. Before that, there were descriptions like uh, seven species in 1799, but as of 2018, there are 100, 450 species plus. So what, what, what changed in all these years? Like what changed from the year 2000 till now? The answer is DNA barcoding. If you see a line over there, in the year 2003, uh, this technique came into picture and it really revolutionized the species descriptions of amphibians. Uh, so I would like to let you know what is DNA barcoding. It would be very non-technical and very simple, although it's complicated, but I would like to tell it in a very brief way. It's nothing but a standard approach uh, where we identify species, uh, plants and animals using DNA from specific portion of a gene. For example, uh, the picture on the right side is a mitochondrial genome and you see the num it's not visible here but there are multiple genes which are color coded like the orange, uh, the, the 12S RNA, 16S RNA. So we could call, these are all genetic markers which are present in all of us and these are the markers which has like which have been standardized for example 16s rrna and coi are the most common genes used for amphibian identification why because they are different in species they vary in species and hence it becomes easy for us to identify them also they are most abundant so that's why it becomes easy for us to identify that so mostly when we do dna barcoding we either use coi gene or we use 16s rrna in most of my work i have used 16s rrna it's easy to get it what I do in the field using DNA barcoding technique. So I go to the field, I collect tadpoles. I am working on a genus called Nictibatrachus or night frogs. Uh, I collect tadpole from the field. Uh, I just collect the tadpole tail tips and not the entire one. Collecting tadpole tail tips doesn't kill tadpoles. So it's a minimally invasive technique. Uh, then uh, these tissues, the tadpole tail tips are collected in ethanol because we don't want it to get dried and damaged uh, in the field. So once collected, we go back to the lab where we extract the DNA using standard techniques. Then we do PCR or it's called as polymerase chain reaction. I'm sure many of you would be knowing it. So what we do is from a small tissue, we amplify the tissue abundantly so that we get multiple copies, which will be helpful for us for the future work. Once we do the PCR in the lab, we then send the products for sequencing and the sequencing is done in a sequencer, DNA sequencer. And once the sequences come, it is in the form of a chromatogram. You see the red uh, multiple colors in this, there's A, T, G, C or the DNA, which I have marked in black. Unfortunately, it is not visible here. So this would be a sequences, DNA sequences, A, T, C, G, A, T, C, G, A, T, C, G. But what is the difference from one species to another species using a genetic marker like 16S? So I have written over there uh, in the PCR uh, slide, DNA plus 16S genetic marker. So we use this genetic marker along with the DNA and other chemicals to do a polymerase chain reaction and finally using the 16S genetic marker we identify whether the species is common or whether it is a new species. <coughs> using a standardized, uh, there is a library for this where we compare the remaining se sequences. So since 2003 uh, there have been around 3700 papers that are published on DNA barcoding and is still going on. So I would really like to say that and would emphasize that DNA barcoding has been a revolutionary and re reliable taxonomic tool. So what are the uses? Uh, cryptic species identification, I will come to this later. Uh, understanding the range extension of species, forensic applications. Today I will be highlighting about cryptic species and range extension. Uh, so what are cryptic species? Cryptic species are those that are morphologically similar. For example, if you see the two images, both of them look very similar, but they are two different species. One is, the upper one is Microhyla nilfamariensis, the other is Microhyla ornata. If you just see their morphology, they are very same, similar. But when you do their genetics, they are two different species. So when uh, a single species, when two different species are identified as single species, so those species are called as cryptic species. So they are looking very similar morphologically, but acoustically, life history traits or genetics could be very different. 
it's important to identify these species because if we don't identify them and, and lump them as single species, then we underestimate the biodiversity we have and it also hampers our conservation <coughs> for such species. I would like to give a case study about my uh, involvement of DNA barcoding. As I said earlier, I work on Nictibatracus or night frogs and I have identified several cryptic species. So this genus, many of you must be knowing, is endemic to Western Ghats. Uh, we identify it uh, using their rhomboid pupil and fork tongue. Uh, they are stream dwelling. And just to give a gist, so in the year 1882, Bollinger, the photo over there, he established this genus with just two species. In 2011, where uh, DNA barcoding technique was used, using this technique from 2 to 16 to finally 26, using the DNA barcoding technique. And right now, 2015, so this 2011 paper was a phenomenal paper by Biju, who used DNA barcoding to identify 10 new Nictibatraca species. And in 2015, where I was involved with Guru and his team, and others like Ruta and Gar, finally took the Nictibatraca species to 37, using DNA barcoding along with acoustics and other life history traits. <coughs> so as I said, so till 2000-2010, it was only morphology. Post that, it was uh, morphology, DNA barcoding and acoustics. So it's the, st the, the trend is still going on. We may find new more species using this technique. So using DNA barcoding, what we found is like there are 37 species as of now distributed across Western Ghats. Interestingly, in Karnataka, we find 10 Nictibatracus. In Kerala, there are 23, the Kerala part of Western Ghats. And in Maharashtra, there are three. As far as I know, the Western Ghats portion in Karnataka is much more than Kerala. But why is it that we only find 10 species here and Kerala, which is comparatively smaller, has 23 more species? One thing is, more research has been done on this region in <coughs> Kerala and that's why you see more number of species. Many of them are cryptic over there as well, but there has been a lot of work done in Kerala. Whereas in Karnataka, what I feel is people have still not looked into these species and there have been many more species than what we say as just 10. So, uh, just want to give an example. Uh, so, be before 2010, uh, and between 2000 and 2012, 10, most of the species that were found in Western Ghats of Karnataka were called as Nictibatracus major, bearing one or two species like Santipalustris. Uh, and these species, uh, these were all morphologically similar, uh, but found in different habitats in Western Ghats, but still were called as N Nictibatracus major. But it was Biju and Dinesh, I believe, and uh, myself and Guru and team. We found that many of these species had similar morphology, like for example, Nictibatracus major had SVA around 43 millimeters, and the species that are on the right also had similar uh, morphology. But when, when we did the genetics, these were split into multiple lineages. So the top one was called as Job. All of these were based on different uh, genetic data. So when you see their genetic data, when you see their calls, we see that they are very distinct from the Nictibatracus major. In fact, Nictibatricus major is now found in Kerala. It's not even in there in Karnataka. So what I'm trying to emphasize is that we go to the field, we looking at their morphology, we feel that, okay, this is the, the same Nictibatricus species that is found everywhere, but we may be wrong. They may be different species. They may be cryptic species. So it's important to use this technique responsibly, ethically, and with minimum invasive technique. So, so because of this, there have been a spurt in new species description. Just would like to tell you the Kumbara discovery. So when Guru was uh, researching this frog in Katle Khan, uh, so from the behavior we knew that it was different. But uh, this species uh, discovered in 2014 from Katle Khan, uh, where I was involved in genetics, Guru in uh, Guru and Dinesh and uh, my guide Ravikant were involved in their morphology and breeding behavior aspects. So what we found is was very similar to Jog. Jog is also found in the same place. But the calls were different, the behavior was different. And finally, I used genetics, I used 16 rRNA gene to identify, where uh, I generated the genetic data and I compared the, this Kumbara species with other Nictibatricus species available. And I found that, so the color differences you see, these are all differences in their genetic sequences. So these are all 35 species at that time. I compared all the 35 species. The top one is uh, Kumbara, and you see that there are differences. Not This portion is not clear, but there were many differences in the gene. Uh, and using statistical tools, uh, with the left over there is a phylogenetic tree. We call it a phylogenetic tree. And we're using statistical tools, we get a strong support statistical support to prove that it is a new species. And that's how I 
along with uh, Guru and others, discovered this species from uh, Katle Khan and we named it as Kumbara, based on its behavior. So what I would like to hi highlight is that many species may be there now, uh, even in this part of the region where we do not know, we actually do not know what is the diversity and this technique could be very handy in describing new species. So uh, just would like to highlight how many species I have described along with the team. Uh, so this was uh, Rao Chester's uh, Honmati from uh, Bilgiri Ranganswami Hills using integrative taxonomic approach, Microhyla lateri. Uh, and uh, as uh, Omkar said in his uh, thing, this is the Karavadi Kappe. Uh, we all used, I have used uh, 16S RRNA marker to describe these species. And would also like to say that there are many species coming up where we are describing some more new species. Please watch out for that. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is the species that, that there are only 10 Nictibatricus species, it may be doubtful, there may be many more. And uh, we need to use DNA barcoding along with morphology and acoustics to really identify the species. And yes, this I would like to emphasize, many people go for large scale sampling, but forgetting that, uh, forgetting the local scale at which we should focus, because the species are cryptic, so there may be possible and they do not move, you know that frogs don't move for large distances. So it's also important to uh, like look into the local scale, small scale and study small streams first, try to identify the species if not then go for dna barcoding the second uh, study that i did was uh, range extension in nictipatracus joke what is range extension range extension is something that we believe that the species is found only at one place but actually it has a large distribution and how you can find it out you can find it out using dna barcoding technique <coughs> so nictipatracus joke as many of you know was discovered from joke falls by biju et al and uh, this was a really landmark paper because uh, the 10 new new species had come at this time. Uh, one of them was Nictipatracus joe. So what the paper said was that it was point endemic, that is it is found only in, uh, in and around Sharavati uh, streams and not anywhere else. So and it's stream dwelling, it is mostly found uh, in fast flowing streams. So the paper emphasized, the paper by Biju emphasized that it's only found in one place in uh, Joke Falls and not found across multiple river basins. So my study was to understand what, where exactly this species is found and I tried looking into multiple populations of this in multiple river basins. So I sampled Sharavati, Aghanashini and uh, Bedti river basins. It was hard to locate because its species is not, not identifiable easily. Uh, again the same technique I used, I went for tadpole tails and I did the same uh, uh, work. So if you can see on the right, there is a map. Uh, so there is a red point where Biju said that it was found only there. And I sampled in multiple uh, river basins. What I found was that uh, this joke was not just in Sharavati, but it was also found in Aghanashini and Bedti, mm -hmm. possibly even more. But at this point of time, we know that it is not point endemic. It's found in multiple river basins. And that the populations that are in Sharavati are completely different, uh, at least different from the other two river basins. You see uh, this yellow line over there that represents Aghanashni individuals, the blue line is Sharavati individuals and the red line is Bedti individuals. So you see that all individuals from the Sharavati basins club together, whereas Bedti individuals are like mixing with the Aghanashni thing. So what it also emphasizes is the movement of these populations. So it's not, it's like there are variation but uh, uh, you see movement as well. So the Bedti populations are also there in Aghanashni, but they are not found in Sharavati, which means that it's possible that there is a barrier where the Bedti and Aghanashni populations are not coming into the Sharavati. So what exactly is that is my future research. But it is em the emphasis over here is that DNA barcoding can also help in finding out the movement of the individuals, but this movement is not direct, it is indirect through genes. And we also would like to emphasize that direct estimate of dispersal estimates are still not being done. So students over there, please look this as a future aspect of research where you can look into direct dispersal estimates and get more data for its conservation. So what I could say, so this paper was published in Mitochondrial DNA Part B in this year. And what I could say is that it was not point endemic, distributed in multiple river basins. And uh, it had specific microhabitats. It was not found everywhere, but wherever it was found, it was found near waterfalls or fast-flowing streams. 
so other thing that i would like to emphasize what that these waterfalls are also places where tourists visit much and most of these places most of these places are defecation spots so it's important that we conserve these habitats for nictipetracus jo and final thing that i would like to say is my phd work that i have been doing for the last 8 years it's about like not dna barcoding but how genetics has also been used not for species identification not for just range extension but also to understand the genetic variation within a species and how that could impact the conservation so uh, i studied uh, <clears throat> i'm studying the species called kemporensis which we all which we, which is found widespread across western ghats and what i was interested is because these are stream dwelling i was interested to know whether river basins influence the genetic variation uh, i'll just go uh, in, in a very brief manner so uh, if, if if since the species is widespread so if there is movement between individuals we would see the same genes across multiple river basins that was one hypothesis and uh, if it is if it is not moving at a large scale and if then there would be multiple haplotypes or there will be multiple uh, genotypes of this species so this would the, so for example sharavati river basin will have a different gene aghnashni will have a different gene betti will different gene that also shows that it is uh, very restricted in movement and doesn't move much so i sampled nine river basins uh, sharavati aghnashni betti kali and many forest department officials have helped me in in uh, getting the individual samples from these places i have sampled all the way till kerala and what i would like to see again i have developed a genetic tree and what you see over there the colors are from different river basins so what you see is multiple colors that means that you doesn't have a single genotype so a single allele so these populations are restricted to certain places certain river basins so you see nine different colors nine different river basins some of them have the same genotype those river basins which are closer to each other for example sharavati aghnashini they have the same uh, in the, uh, genotype whereas as you move further like the kerala or the kurg genotype is completely different which also says about its dispersal the so closer they are they are moving as 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 soon as the distance moves you see a different genotype so in conclusion i would like to highlight that uh, genetics is very important to <coughs> help in amphibian conservation especially for a place like western ghats which has high diversity but yet nothing is being done nothing has been researched yet more dedicated studies uh, not just for taxonomy but other things like natural history genetic variation life history traits are really very important and uh, would also like to mention that forest department people have been very helpful for like collecting samples and i hope that they would help us in uh, getting permissions and support our work i would like to thank the karnataka forest department for the permits uh dst for funding my work and uh, guru raja amit hegde cr naik uh, bajentri uh, there are many people who have helped me in getting uh, the field uh, samples and dr kartik sunagar and the evolutionary genomics lab at ces where i am stationed yet thank you very much for listening